There is a lot to celebrate. If you look at innovation, over the last century has doubled the life expectancy in over 100 years. That's a tremendous achievement in which we could celebrate the impact of innovation in health and the life sciences industries. You can also see the biggest contributor is in public health, nearly 80% contribution to that. And at the same time, some of the major, uh, five major preventable diseases, the death from rose has, has reduced from 6.5 million to about 0.5 billion. It's also worth remembering that in the early part of the 20th century, a family was spending twice the amount of money on funerals rather than on health care. Because that, in many, many ways, is the main theme of innovation and the need for innovation in health care uh, in this modern era of unsustainable expenditure in this very important area. If you happen to be a healthcare policymaker, if you happen to be a minister like I was for two years, I lost my way and I found myself uh, in the heart of politics for some very odd reason, you will see the challenges facing you, whether you're running a healthcare system that is publicly funded or privately funded. Firstly, the growing burden of disease and the changing nature of disease, lifestyle diseases. Who would have predicted three years ago we'll be dealing now with an epidemic of obesity? Uh, other lifestyle diseases uh, are, are also leading to increased prevalence in diabetes, a good example, uh, associated with lifestyle diseases. Higher patient expectations. I think we've looked at all the other sectors and the, and the major innovations of the last two, three, four decades, whether it's energy or climate change. I think patients' expectations is something that is constantly changing. Uh, and if you fix one problem, there's yet another problem to address. The rising cost of health care. And I think there is a perception in health that unlike any other sector where innovation is about improving quality, reducing cost, in healthcare, for some reason, innovation always adds cost. And I could explain why. Healthcare is the one sector in which we may commission something new, but we rarely decommission the old. And that is a major, major challenge. Now, we're talking about a time in which most health economies are finding it extremely challenging to close the gap as a result of the recent economic downturn. In the US, they're spending 18.3% of their GDP on health. In the UK, we're spending 8.3% of our GDP on health. And that gap is getting bigger and bigger. And not only that, we're also about to hit with another tsunami of the baby boomers. What's also interesting about health, there is no correlation between the amount of money you spend and the quality of health care you get. And this is an interesting slide looking at the outputs from the Commonwealth Fund, looking at the healthcare systems and the attributes of quality in a healthcare system. And you can see the, slow, the lower the numbers, the better you're doing as a healthcare system. Uh, and uh, I'm always very careful presenting this slide in the US just in case I don't get a visa the next time I go. You can see the US spends 18.3% uh, of its GDP on healthcare, but it has one of the worst outcomes. So that's another important message, that it doesn't mean throwing more money at healthcare, you're going to get a better outcome at the end. And that really summarizes what are the main challenges facing healthcare systems. This is a piece of work that I was involved in in the World Economic Forum, which came up with these seven bad habits of healthcare systems. And I think in Russia, you have the opportunities, without having the legacies, of redesigning a healthcare system to avoid some of these major challenges. And I'm not going to go through the seven, but the notable ones are you design a healthcare system, you're always measuring the inputs rather than the outputs. For some reason, doing more healthcare seems to be perceived as better healthcare. As I say, most of our healthcare systems are designed to deliver what is possible rather than what is necessary. And these are the challenges that need, we need to address. So I think I've made the case why we need change. So what does that change entail? Uh, and this is, a, the, if you like, the seven 
recommendations that we came up with about a year ago, and really looking how do you evaluate a healthcare system and what are the fundamental changes that we need to make in redesigning such systems. Firstly, measuring value uh, and, and defining what that value means, not just in terms of outcomes from a patient experience perspective as well, and pay for value. Uh, how do you transform a healthcare system from being a sickness service, which is how they were all designed about four or five decades ago, into a health and well-being service? How do you change the mindset and the value proposition of a healthcare system? How do you reinvent the del delivery systems? How do you come up with the new business models in driving some of these innovations in not just improving quality, but also reducing cost? Some examples in my own field. Uh, the chair was very uh, gracious in introducing some of the work that I lead uh, in areas of surgical technology. You know, we're moving from open surgery to minimally invasive surgeries. We did that about 10 years ago. We're actually moving now from surgery to incisionless surgery, which is a, a, an oxymoron, a paradox in itself carrying surgery without making incisions with the combination of imaging, smart instruments, smart devices. One of the major drivers for minimally invasive surgeries, believe it or not, was the stapling technologies were actually were, were, dis, were, were put together in Russia, in Moscow, in this city, in the 1960s, that has really transformed and revolutionized uh, the concept of minimally invasive surgeries nearly four decades later. The concept of robotic surgery and the use of, uh, of uh, master-slave manipulators in enhancing the precision of surgery. We're going to see more of that in decades to come. I think the other big challenge is, is the challenge which has been the, the biggest burden of disease in the past, which is infectious disease, but hospital-acquired infections. One of the big challenges facing healthcare providers. You go to a hospital to have a surgical procedure, you leave a hospital with an infection you never had before, whether that is an MRSA, whether that is a Clostridium difficile. And there are some examples that you don't actually have to invest in very expensive technology. Redesigning your healthcare system, bringing the design council as we did in the UK, has had a huge impact in reducing hospital acquired infections by a significant. Uh, uh, fold in a very short period of time by purely redesigning the environment in which clinicians, doctors and nurses are practicing and delivering healthcare. However, the most exciting is what was recently described in Clay Christensen's book, which is how are we moving from the era of evidence-based practice into the era of precise medicine. The era in which we can predict the nature of that disease, a smarter diagnostics in which we can tailor the treatment around the needs of that patient. And you can see different disease entities moving from that very intuitive way of diagnostics into the very precise way of achieving that diagnostic accuracy. What does that mean? That means we will start in the future and move away from the era in which we treat differentiated people with an undifferentiated set of drugs. If 100, of 100 people sitting in this room had migraine, all of you will be treated with the same drug. We all know those 100 people are very different genetically and phenotypically. Understanding the genome and the phenome and combining that data is going to allow a wealth of innovation in the life sciences industry. What does that going to do to cost? Huge amounts. This is where we are in the cost curve. In other words, we treat when the symptoms become apparent and curative treatment. This is what's going to happen in this molecular diagnostic era in which we're going to be identifying disease and treating it at an earlier phase. That is my last slide to finishing off, as I can see the moderator is moving around. I think ultimately, as Moscow has led this meeting, it is systems or healthcare systems that will innovate are the ones that will survive. And I bring this slide, uh, certainly being a few years away from the 200-year uh, anniversary of Darwin, uh, when he very eloquently said, it's not the strongest of the species that will survive, but those who are most uh, able to change and respond to that change. Thank you.